amazing thing that I get to introduce Rich because we, we were both kids when we met here, really. I was a little kid. He was a bit taller than me. Um, it was probably 37 years ago or something like that. But before I explain how that all came to be, I'm going to run through the crib notes of Rich's life just to give you a picture of this extraordinary guy. He was raised in Dobbs Ferry and then Millwood, New York. He was a camper at Timberlake from 1966 to 1970, and then a staff at Timberlake for seven years from the mid-70s to the early 80s. He met his wonderful wife, Chrissy, at a dance, I think in Boston, as I remember. And they've had four kids who are all incredible. Uh, and they've all spent many summers at Farm and Wilderness. Uh, staff, campers, they've uh, been at the family camp for years. Rich served on the board. You could go on and on about his f and w participation. But Rich has achieved a tremendous amount outside of FMW. He spent a year in Thailand in high school and learned to speak Thai fluently. Then he went to Harvard. He spent a year in China when he was at Harvard and learned to speak Chinese fluently. Then followed med school at Dartmouth and Brown. And he did his training at the Deaconess Hospital in Boston, where he then went on to become staff and had an incredibly uh, incredible practice there. Always thoughtful, calm, considered, firm. Over 20, the last 25 years, he's had so many leadership roles, boards, and running many meetings. You know, Rich, when he's faced with like a complex issue, he's one of those people that you, you go to him for counsel and he always takes right action. Uh, he chooses the high road as opposed to the easy road. Um, now in his current position at the Chief Medical Officer at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, he supervises, he's the boss of about 2,000 physicians. Uh, he has had to give up his own clinical practice because that's a big job. Um, <laughs> always with an eye on access to care and equity, Rich really works hard within the beast of the medical care system. I mean, he's right there in the beast. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty hard place to be. He fights for health care access for those who need it. He remains a strong believer in a single-payer health system, although that's not going to happen anytime soon, but he, he comes from that place. Most recently, I think he's been instituting a program for nurse practitioners to provide home visits to sick elderly patients in the Boston area. He's training many of the internists at the Deaconess, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in palliative care, which is not something you get in your internal medicine training too often during your actual residency. So an amazing man. But if you just give me another minute, I'll tell you about my, very briefly about my personal experience with Rich. And I think it'll exemplify just the wise and steady presence he's had on my life and on many's. So June uh, 1977, um, my parents took me to the Boston Greyhound station. It's not where it is now. Um, they put a trunk on a bus and put me on a bus. Um, they'd heard about Farm and Wilderness at some slideshow around Boston somewhere. <laughs> you know, and they shipped me up here. They, times are different. I mean, a lot of parents couldn't, they had no idea where they were sending me. They'd never been here. They'd never, they're just like, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I actually miss those kind of parents. Um, <laughs> um, so I drove up Route 100 there, took a left into Farm and Wilderness Road. You know, in my child's eye, was, uh, that's how I, I, I remember it. It's almost like a one, I think it was very narrow. It was dirt. The dam, nothing like the dam that is there now. You know, it was, you know how those dams you see in the country, the, the sheets of pressure treated wood, water kind of seeping through them? That was the dam. Um, it really was. The fairgrounds looked completely different at that time. So you, I, I pulled, we pulled into the gravel pit, and I was a f honestly kind of frightened 11 year old kid, and I came down those stairs, and you know, I was in a crowd of people, and this guy's like, Will Anninger? And it was this. God, this tan, skinny, strong guy. He had like a big black afro, uh, big head of hair. And he had this deep, like resonant voice. And uh, he just grabbed my hand and he's like, is that your trunk? Let's go. And you know, within 48 hours, I knew like I had this, just this 
great guy that I was going to be with for the summer. And, um, and I also knew that it wasn't just a great guy. I was, I was at a great place. I mean, I just felt at home for one of the first times in my life, like just in my heart. I could just settle. Um, and for those of you who have the good fortune of attending great summer camps, and there are many, not only this one, but you know, you know what it's like when you just have a great counselor. They're inspiring. You look up to them. They're just amazing uh, mentors. You just, you just, they're just, uh, just incredible people for you. And I had the great opportunity to have Rich twice as a counselor, so I was really spoiled. Now, Rich will claim that I think he was one of the worst counselors of all time at FNW because during my first summer, our cabin burned down. <laughs> It's all right, it worked out. <laughs> you know, but Rich's, Rich's guidance of me did not end, in, end there at all. Like he was, he was, you know, I don't know about your, maybe your college kids are like this, but I remember visiting him at his college co-op on Mass Ave when he was at Harvard. You know, and I was just a kid and he's just confident enough to take me around and introduce me to his friends and show me all the things he'd had in Thailand and China hanging in his room. Then, when I returned from my years abroad uh, in West Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer, he was my doc. He got rid of a lot of nasty parasites that I had. <laughs> and, then, and then later, I pondered being a doctor, and um, I, I went to talk to Rich about it. And he, he's like, go for it. Don't even think twice. It's a great thing to do. You'll, you'll love it. Um, and I spent a few great days with a master clinician at the Deaconess Hospital just watching him do his work. And I went for it, and, um, and I have never regretted it. It's, I feel so fortunate, and Rich pushed me there. I actually ended up choosing Dartmouth Medical School because Rich had loved it there. He said it was a great place to be, and I couldn't agree more. It was by far my best educational experience. It was a great school. And then, actually, it, it didn't even stop. It's seven or eight years ago, we were chatting on the fairgrounds, and uh, you know, a week later, someone called me and said, you know, Rich Parker suggested you might be interested in serving on the F&W board. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so Rich just has nudged me along. But, <laughs> But he's really played a very important role at significant junctures in my life. Like really been there to give me the right advice, the, really the right advice. And I just explained this to convey it as an example of what just Rich has done and continues to do for patients, for his employees, his thousands of employees, his campers, his friends, his family, and of course, his farm and wilderness. So um, thanks for everything, Rich. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Wow, I'm speechless. Um, well, thank you, Will, for that incredibly sweet and kind um, introduction. Obviously, it's very touching um, and meaningful to me. Uh, to be here and to have been given so much and to be able to give back. Um, before I start with my remarks, I'd like to introduce the members of my family who are here. It's my beautiful wife, Chrissy, and Isabel and Charles. You guys want to stand up, wave. Um, and the rest of our family, our immediate family, uh, could not be here tonight because Louise is up at Saltash Mountain Camp having too much fun to be here. And Julius uh, is a counselor at Timberlake. So um, he can't be here either. I tried to get him down and he said, Dad, I gotta be at the banquet, come on. Uh, so uh, thank you, Peter, um, and the board, um, directors, uh, former directors, parents, grandparents, campers, future campers. Um, I give a number of talks during the year, and I, I like giving talks. I think it's fun. And this is a talk I've never given before. Um, and I also didn't share it with my family. I asked them if they wanted to hear it, and they said no. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, OK, let's just, let's just roll this out here and see what happens. Um, I thought it'd be a little more fun than 
than practicing it. So this will be a little a bit of an experiment. Um, while I'm giving this talk, I'm going to pass this folder around. I've showed it to many of you tonight, but if you didn't have a chance to see it, uh, I'll pass it around and just uh, enjoy. There are some pictures in there of uh, Ken Webb and Al Hicks and my camp cabins from 1974 and 1975. Andy Perkins is here. Where are you, Andy? Andy's in one of the, those cabins. Um, so I did write a few things down, honestly. Um, and I want you to imagine a group of boys sitting around a fire in the dark, and the sparks are going upward, and the coals are glowing, and they're laughing voices. And that's our backyard, because our kids have a fire pit in the backyard, and that's what they do. And it could be boys, it could be girls, it could be boys and girls. Um, and where did they learn it? They learned it here. Um, so we all are on a journey, and there's actually a reason that we're here together. And the reason we're here together tonight is because farm and wilderness is part of our journey. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is how farm and wilderness can be a mirror for your life. And if you've had the good fortune, as I have, to have been a camper, a counselor, a board member, a parent, a barn day camp parent, family camp, work weekends, ice cutting. Um, the place is the same. The mountains are the same. The sky is the same. The lake is the same. The smells are the same. But we change. And it's been an incredible gift to me through my life to be able to come back here and experience myself here um, in this place. All four of our children have come here, Julius, Isabel, Charles, and Louisa. Um, I'm sorry that they missed Flying Cloud. That is the one camp we missed, and I do regret that. So if we get another chance, um, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll do Flying Cloud. Um, Barn Day Camp also was a, a wonderful chance for us to reconnect with Will and Carol and their beautiful children, and we had so much fun. Um, at Barn Day Camp where we dropped our kids off and then the parents would get to go hiking um, all over the valley and get lost and, and have all sorts of adventures. I want to mention that farm and wilderness is a place where people can take risks, um, risks of both a physical nature and an emotional nature and a spiritual nature. Um, I'm going to read you a quote. This is by a lady named Ad Anne Woodleaf and I like the fact that her last name is Woodleaf. She says, the major premise of transcendental eco-wisdom, I'm not really sure what that is, but anyway, <laughs> is that connection with nature is essential for a person's intellectual, aesthetic, and moral health and growth. So I want you to think about that a little bit. So in 1966, um, arrived in the mail an envelope from Plymouth, Vermont, and there was a green, I remember this very vividly, there was a green trifold brochure, and I was nine, and my parents were sending my older sister, Laura, to Indian Brook. And I looked at the brochure, yay, Indian Brook, and there was a boy jumping off a dock into a lake. And I looked at that picture and I said, wow, I want to go to this camp. <laughs> so, I figured I had to deal with my parents somehow, so instead of just asking them if I go to camp, I wrote a letter, and I took it to the post office, and I mailed it to my parents, and I said, I want to go to this camp. So what could they do? So um, like Will, in a way, my parents dropped my sister and me off. My parents, at that time, camp was eight weeks, um, not seven and not four, it was eight. And my parents were heading off to Europe. They were really out the door. Um, see you later. And I remember my first day of camp in 1966, walking down the path to Wiki Up Cabin. And my, my counselors were Tim Ashley and Aki Barrara. Now, just out of curiosity, how many in this room remember either of those guys? Raise your hand. Right, so some of you remember those guys. And um, I loved Aki Barrara. He was a most amazing counselor to me. Um, he was from Ethiopia, and he was a kind, sweet, energetic, enthusiastic man. 
and I remembered when I came back the next summer, I couldn't wait to see him, and I went running, when I saw him, I went running up the path, and he held his arms out, and I jumped into his arms, and he caught me. Um, I looked him up recently, he's a senior advisor to the World Bank, recently retired. <laughs> um, another friend from my first summer was Jesse Hamer, does anybody remember Jesse? And Jesse uh, was a black kid from Baltimore, and I grew up in Westchester County. I didn't grow up with any black people. And Jesse became one of my best friends, and I went to Baltimore, and then he'd come to my house, and we'd switch back and forth, and it was great. Um, and I want to talk about Timberlake a little bit. As some of you may have this if you've been to camp many years. There's a muscle memory where I actually know all those trails. I could walk down those trails in the dark, tonight, um, and I would know where I was going, except for the new trails. <laughs> that might be a problem. Um, I remember my first trip as a camper to Left Camp. Anybody remember Left Camp? Left Camp was literally a patch of dirt on the other side of the dam. <laughs> that was Left Camp. And I remember a long trip up to Tinkerbrook, and that was hard, because I was only nine. Um, I remember riding in the back of the Big Green. I remember when I was 14, um, canoeing on the Rapid River, and that river moved really fast. And I remember the, the experience of being trapped by a canoe, between a canoe and a rock, and the water coming down hard. Um, we hiked over the top of Lafayette. We swam at the Flume. Um, they don't let you swim at the Flume anymore. You can't get in there, but we did. Um, I remember hiking up Bond Cliffs in the White Mountains, and I had a pack on, and it was a hot day. And I just couldn't take it. It was so heavy, and I was having so much trouble getting up the mountain. It was really steep. And I remember wanting to sit down in the trail and cry. <laughs> I didn't, but I wanted to. Somebody said, keep going. Um, so there is a lot about camp, about over learning to overcome adversity. Um, these are life lessons. They're not just kid lessons. They're life lessons. I remember the excitement of all camp games. We play capture the flag down at the fairgrounds. We'd use the entire fairgrounds, and the road would be the dividing line. Where else can you do that? Um, the counselors in the 1960s, to me, were amazing role models. I wrote down they were cool, they were strong, they were gentle, they were talented, they were funny, they were kind. They also were burning their draft cards. Um, it was an interesting time. Um, the banquet was magical and a little sad. It was time to say goodbye at the end of the summer. We got our birch bark plaques and awards. I learned to play for square dances when I was 10. And I play the violin. And I've had the joy of playing for square dances for 40 plus years now at Farm and Wilderness. And I love the rollicking music of the square dance. And I love watching the mirth of the dancers and it never changes, it's always great. Um, talk for a second about Ken Webb. Um, uh, you know, Rob is here, Christy is here, Ken's children and grandchildren have been long supporters of the camps, and I remember Ken, I was a boy, and he always seemed old to me, even though he wasn't that old, but he always seemed old. And Ken was a small man, and he had a small voice, but he was able to hold a group of boys wrapped, wrapped in front of the fire down at the end of the cove at Timberlake, and he would regale us with stories. I don't know where he got those stories, but they came out of him, and we sat there entranced. Um, the other memory of Ken is him driving us in the Packard, uh, and it's only because I had faith that he wouldn't kill us as we went over the fairgrounds up and down, and the thing would kind of um, so I have very good memories of, of Ken and Susan. Some other counselors who made an impression on me, Kelly Olive taught me how to swim. I didn't like the water. I didn't like swimming. I was afraid of the water. And Kelly taught me how to swim. Um, Dick Winterbottom taught me how to wrestle. It's a good skill to have as a counselor. Um, I learned how to throw a frisbee, build a cooking fire, use an ax, carry a pack, use a map and compass. Um, and I learned something about meeting. Now, it used to be called meeting for worship. I guess we don't call it meeting for worship now. We call it meeting. 
Silent, silent meeting. Um, but it's the same, and it's always been the same. Um, and it was a way to feel the community, the pulse of the community, the sense of the community. Were people sad? Were they troubled? Were they happy? Were they energetic? Were they bored? Where were they? You could feel it all. And certainly the power of meeting is greater than the sum of its parts. And one of the things I love about meeting is that everybody was honored, regardless of their age or what they had to say. So a nine-year-old was talking about the squirrels very earnestly. And a counselor, and I'm remembering specific people, was talking of the parable of people with sticks tied to their arms. And they fed each other food, right? I remember a meeting up at Saltash Mountain Camp a couple of years ago on visiting day. And to me, it was a most remarkable meeting. For those of you that have been up at SAM, at the meeting circles up on the hill, and there's usually a little breeze, and birds are chirping. And the parents were there, and the kids were there, and not a word was said the entire meeting. It's remarkable. But it was a powerful meeting. It wasn't a meeting of people sitting disconnected. It was a meeting of people sitting truly connected, deeply connected in silence. I also want to say something about the physical body. The physical body that we all inhabit is something that we a little bit take for granted. I'm not speaking as a physician now, I'm speaking as me. Um, and I think that farm and wilderness, this is not something we talk about very much, gives people an appreciation of their physical body. And that is a great gift. Um, other counselor experiences, well, Learning how to lead through example, learning how to listen to a group of boys, learning how to speak loudly. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all been at, at meetings at work where you can't hear the person who's speaking. Well, if you've been a counselor at Farm and Wilderness, you know how to talk to a group of people. <laughs> um, we learned how to build a team in the cabin. And I like to say at work, in my job presently, we are a team, not a committee. I don't like committees. I like teams. And we build teams here at camp. Um, at Tamarack Farm, the phrase, work is love made visible, is over the farmhouse door. And I have thought about that saying for many, many years. And I think it's uh, very profound, actually. Um, I learned a lot about relationships. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that tonight. <laughs> I, th I threatened Peter that I was going to talk about all the relationships I ever had at Fireman Wilderness, and that was going to be my whole talk. I, I won't do that. Um, I want to mention uh, a couple of other people. Um, Al Hicks um, was, to me, a very special person. He ran the Timberlake Kitchen. I'm passing around a picture of him. It might come around to you. Um, he was an incredible role model for hard work, for grace, for kindness. Um, Al had an amazing dry sense of humor. And uh, he had a saying, if you walk through the kitchen and you weren't exactly doing what you were supposed to be doing and he wanted to send you that message, um, he might say to you, if you play ball with me, I'll play ball with you. But just remember, I own the bats, the balls, the bases, and the ball field. <laughs> I got a call this past week from a former co-counselor of mine named Moose Jim Burden, and he was reminding me, we were co-counselors in 1975, and this picture's coming around, and he reminded me that we were put together pre-camp, and we were having so much fun together pre-camp that the director of the camp said, you know, I don't think you guys should be together. <laughs> I'm going to separate you and put you in different cabins. Now, I was only 21, but Jim was... 28, and he said, nope, we're staying together. <laughs> and we did, and we had a lot of fun. Um, also, Farm and Wilderness is an amazing place where you might get an idea for your life. It just might come to you. And uh, one summer after college, I was working as a counselor, and I really didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And um, where were Al and Judy Muja? You're here somewhere, right? So Al and Judy Muja. Um, Al was a camp doctor and Judy was a camp nurse. And I was always drawn to the infirmary 
And it's not because I was sick. I was very interested in the doctor and the nurse. Why is that? And I'll tell you why. Because they could handle any kid that came in there. They could handle any counselor that came in there. They could handle anybody that came in there with whatever the problem was. And it didn't matter if it was a physical problem, an emotional problem, a spiritual problem, a psychic problem, an existential problem. <laughs> right? They knew what to do. And I was very impressed by that. And I was also very impressed by Dr. Maisel, who was one of the other camp doctors. And this little light went on in my head and said, you know what? You can be a doctor. And I did. So there. <laughs> um, so maybe I owe my career inspiration to farm and wilderness, too. Um, a couple of sayings I learned at Timber Lake that have been good in life in general. Observe, don't judge. It's a good one. Um, Life is short, things may change. <laughs> I had a line when kids would say to me, a kid would say, can I do fill in the blank? And I would say, use your judgment. <laughs> That's worked well for me in life. <laughs> happens all the time. Doctors come and say, can I do that? Use your judgment. <laughs> See what happens. There was one line at Timber Lake in retrospect, that I do not think is really correct. And the line was, it's just a summer camp. And counselors would say that when we were having some pressure or some difficulty or the times were tough, we'd say, well, it's just a summer camp. It's not just a summer camp. It's part of your life in a profound way that will become part of your life, and it's not just a summer camp. So I want to move a little bit um, to some experiences as a parent um, some of our children hit rough spots in growing up, as all kids do. Um, I know that Isabel was not totally thrilled with middle school. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, okay. And I think it's fair to say that when she went to Indian Brook, she was cared for, she was honored as a person. And when she went to Tamarack Farm, she was cared for and she was honored as a person. And all our children were cared for and honored as children and as people. I think it's fair to say that our kids came home from camp physically stronger, they came home kinder, and they came home more centered than when they went. I'm going to read you a couple of fragments from letters that, bye, we'll see, it, see it's fair. Um, Julius the counselor at Timberlake. So uh, I didn't ask his permission, but I think he'll be okay with this. <laughs> Paternalistic father, <laughs> you, and I am, and I'll pay the consequences. Okay, so this is, Char Julius sent this letter to Charles. Dear Charles, this is from Timberlake this summer. One change I love is how many musicians, counselors, and campers are participating in morning songs. And then he wrote to us, hey family, I am writing to you from Lost Shelter, sitting in a hammock and watching J1 campers collect wood for a wet fire. One of my campers is as tall as my waist, so my co-counselor, Rafi, and I have been taking turns hoisting up his backpack so he can walk uphill. <laughs> and then he writes, Hi, Mom. Being a counselor has made me think a bit about parenting. Seeing how difficult some kids can be to handle furthers my appreciation for the work you and Dad continue to put in. <laughs> Sometimes I'm frustrated by putting in so much effort in on a camper with little to no appreciation for it. <laughs> but this makes the moments of progress quite rewarding. <laughs> I'll keep working on it. Love, Julius. Then he wrote to Isabel, and this was after my father died um, this summer. He wrote, Isabel, I'm sitting on the edge of the tree that we jumped off of during family camp some years ago. Living outdoors is becoming less of an escape as it turns into normalcy I find myself taking moments to observe and appreciate the calm of it all more and more frequently. I heard the news about Grandpa when I got back from my trip. Two days ago, I spent the better part of my day off sitting on Bear Pit and reflecting on his life, a humbling experience. When I called home, Charlie told me you, you, you and Mom had left for Kripalu. I'll have to go with you sometime. Love, Julius. And then on a 
more cheerful note, this is a letter from Louisa at Salt Ash Mountain Camp. Cover your ears, Peter. <laughs> Flagstaff was amazing. We were in a cloud on every peak, which was kind of cool because everything was white and misty. We reached our campsite at 8 p.m., but the site was full. We had dinner and then started canoeing again. It was beautiful. We were paddling into the sunset over the Flagstaff Mountains, and there was a big yellow crescent moon that slowly began to rise. The sky was absolutely filled with stars. We could see the Milky Way and a few shooting stars. We finally reached our campsite at 2 a.m. <laughs> it was super late, but totally worth all the extra work. So just a couple notes about family camp, um, which is just a fantastic opportunity. Seven days to build a community. We make it happen. It's a safe environment for people to take risks. Um, and the spring and fall weekends are kind of a faster version of family camp. Um, a point about the board, um, the experience on the board helped me learn how the sausage is made, so to speak. Um, governing by consensus, which is how our board works, is a very unusual skill to learn in our society. I can't say that I employ it all the time at my job, but I do sometimes, and um, it's, it's, it's a gift to have learned that. I learned this on the board, and I really learned this as a counselor too, and I didn't understand this as a camper, that farm and wilderness is not utopia. It is made up of people with all of our gifts and all of our flaws. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that farm and wilderness is a good place to learn about forgiveness. And it's always sad to me when a person's been at farm and wilderness and they have great years here and then they leave on some unhappy note because something happened and they don't come back or maybe they don't come back for a long time. And that's a bit of a sadness because it's a hole that's left. And I feel that Farm and Wilderness has been a good place to learn about forgiveness and try to bring people back. Um, I want to really thank all the executive directors, um, in addition to the Webbs who got us started, um, Jack Hunter, who's here, and Len Kedwallader, who's not here tonight, Rich Satterthwaite, Rob Schultz, and of course, Peter. Um, and I thank them all for their loving work and dedication to the camp. Um, I specifically want to thank Peter for listening to me uh, about a couple of things. When he started, I walked around, we were over at Indian Brook, and I said, Peter, you know something? These kaibos really stink. <laughs> and I said, as a physician, I can tell you that someday the Vermont Public Health Board is going to come here, they're going to shut the whole camp down. And they might warn you and they might not, but they could do it. All they need is one parent to raise holy hell and they close this whole place down. And I was remembering how pre-camp we used to come and dig out the kaibos. And I'm not going to go into that in detail. <laughs> in any case, Peter listened and he, he did research and he changed the whole system so that camp does not smell bad now and the kaibos are composting and there are trucks that come in and take the refuse out and make it turn into something, um, <laughs> something better. So, so, so thank you, Peter, for not only that, obviously, but all the great, great work that you've done. And I can, cert I can certainly say, as a friend of Farm and Wilderness and a parent and a f former board member, all that stuff, that the camp is in far better shape than it was um, since Peter came. So thank you, Peter. Just a shout out to the board members. You know, nobody understands board members in any organization. That's just a fact of life. Um, and the board members are volunteers, and they care deeply about the camps, and they give freely to ensure the camp's stability and growth. And there's a very delicate governance structure here at Farm and Wilderness, with emphasis on the word delicate. And it requires transparency, and it requires integrity, and it requires hard work in order for it to continue and prosper. So I'm coming down the home stretch here, and thank you for your rapt attention. <laughs> I want to offer you a few reflections um, on my experience through my life with Farm and Wilderness. And these are a little bit random, but you'll, you'll take them in the spirit in which they are offered. We human beings are animals with clothes on. 
we evolved from the natural world. And I think that in some way, we find profound comfort and peace being in the natural world. I'm going to read you a quote. There is new life in the soil for every person. There is healing in the trees for tired minds and for our overburdened spirits. There is strength in the hills, if only we will lift up our eyes. Remember that nature is your great restorer. That quote is by, anybody? Any takers? Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> July 25th, 1924. Who knew? Uh, we did not evolve to multitask with cell phones and iPads and email and text and TV and all the constant input. And I will say, speaking as a physician, that I think all of that input is not healthy. It causes ambient stress, anxiety, <laughs> the fight or flight response with adrenaline and elevated cortisol levels. It's really not good for us. And I think more than ever, Farm and Wilderness offers a path back to nature with the gifts of strength and tranquility, which really are an amazing counterweight to all the junk that comes at us, um, and especially our children. Uh, though we don't state it explicitly at camp, we do celebrate and use the human body. Um, we did not evolve to live in our heads, we live in our bodies. And it's kind of a little known secret in the yoga philosophy that the spiritual world can be accessed through the physical body. And I think that farm and wilderness is a very rare place that intuitively understands this and nurtures this and fosters this and celebrates this and allows people to find a degree of spirituality through their physicality. Um, farm and wilderness attracts and creates leaders. Um, and the Quaker tenet of a light within each of us is a wonderful guiding principle for life for people of all faiths or no faiths. Um, an institution such as Farm and Wilderness survives decades. Why? Because it is founded on a solid foundation and each successive generation invests itself in its evolution and protection. So coming down the home stretch here, thanks uh, to all the counselors and campers who choose to live fully at Farm and Wilderness and to the parents who have the faith to send their children. I'm going to read you a last poem. That I'll tell you who wrote this one. This is by George Santayana. And he writes, the muffled syllables that nature speaks fill us with deeper longing for her word. She hides a meaning that the spirit seeks. She makes a sweeter music than is heard. So in closing, Farm and Wilderness continues as a deep mirror for all of us as we continue on our own journeys alone and together. Thank you.